And um, I'm talking about uh, what I, I'm going to be calling the gas busy caribou, to make it short. Uh, so the U11 and uh, this uh, carrot population is usually speaking French, but I tried to make it clear in English, so. Um, I'm gonna be wrong. Yeah, okay, you saw that map a couple of times today. Uh, I'm gonna draw your attention about this small dot here. So uh, the guest busy caribou is uh, belonging to the woodland caribou subspecies. And uh, in the case of uh, the Zangibola unit, it's the smallest DU, uh, comprising only one population. So it's quite easy to just synthesize this afternoon, but you saw that there's a bunch of new information that are interesting to figure out what's uh, the challenge uh, that, that this uh, population is facing. So just uh, reviewing the different lines of evidence that we have, uh, there's uh, different facets of uh, the gas busy caribou ecology that we know quite well. There's so many information that we don't know yet, and I'm going to be glad to present some orientation of the research program that we're starting now about uh, that population. So the first line of evidence, we don't know a lot about the phylogenetics of that population. There's no study that does include samples from those animals in the past. Uh, about the genetic diversity and structure, sounds like uh, the guest busy carrot population is significantly differentiated uh, from a genetic point of view from six other populations in Quebec. So it's a um, uh, study that was carried out by uh, Réon Courtois and his team. Uh, you can see different populations of migratory caribou, forest living caribou, and this uh, mountain caribou here. And on the bottom graph, you can see that the mountain caribou is uh, genetically distinct from the migratory caribou and from all the different forest dwelling uh, uh, caribou populations that were uh, investigated in that uh, study. Uh, about the morphology, sounds like we don't have no morphological data uh, for that population too, uh, and uh, then we cannot just build our decision about attributing a DU to that population on that uh, line of evidence. About the movement, here you have um, uh, digital elevation model of the caribou range in Gaspésie, so it's quite small and uh, it's essentially uh, within the limit of the Gaspésie National Park. I'm calling it the Gaspésie National Park, but it's uh, a, a national park following the Provincial Act of Quebec about, uh, about protected areas. And you can see on this map that most of the ca uh, caribou uh, locations are uh, at high elevations, so they're not in the valleys, they're thick around the alpine tundra and the subalpine forest. And uh, those animals are belonging to the mountain ecotypes, so they are um, exhibiting uh, altitudinal migrations from alpine habitats uh, during the summer and during the calving period uh, toward the subalpine fear forest during the winter uh, where they're foraging on uh, arboreal lichens essentially. So they are mostly confined to the Gatsby's National Park from what we have uh, as information now. Uh, but uh, just to give you some information, there's only two different uh, telemetry surveys that were conducted on that population using the HF colors. So that picture uh, was uh, obtained uh, with a, a telemetry survey conducted between 1998 and 2001. Uh, so uh, it's still a little bit I would say outdated, and we're gonna try to find a way the next uh, months and next years to uh, put GPS collars on those animals and see if there's uh, uh, excursions outside the, the boundaries of the national park. Sounds like caribou are traveling back and forth all across the Gaspésie Peninsula, maybe without success about their survival, but we've tried to find a way to uh, add information on that. So about uh, the distribution, you can see where is the Gatsby's National Park here. So there's a large natural barrier, which is the St. Lawrence River. Uh, so it's the sole carrot population remaining on the south shore of the St. Lawrence River, isolated since almost a century now. It's the, um, a population that is also anthropogenically isolated because of a uh, quite impressive amount of uh, human-induced disturbance, uh, cutovers, agriculture, uh, and uh, and uh, the, uh, cities and also roads. So there's a, a kind of anthropogenic barriers here that prevent some kind of exchange with all the woodland carrot population that we have in Quebec. Uh, and it's also uh, the uh, last vestige of the earth that once occupied the uh, northeastern uh, United States, so New England, but also the Nova Scotia and New Brunswick. So from a distribution point of view, uh, being uh, 
in a, a range that is totally disconnected from other caribou population and also being uh, the only uh, caribou uh, residing in the Atlantic ecoregion, um, it's uh, worth uh, the fact to attribute uh, uh, this animal unit to, uh, uh, to that population. So if we just try to wrap up the, uh, that information that was used to establish the discreteness and the significance of that DU, so they are genetically differentiated, uh, the range that they are inhabiting is uh, disconnected from the other uh, caribou range. They belong to the montanical type, which is uh, quite different from boreal caribou, which is the most proximal uh, group of caribou that are geographically uh, near uh, those animals. But they are also the only uh, caribou population remaining in the Atlantic ecoregion. So all of these uh, reasons uh, helped uh, Kosiewicz to decide to attribute the DU status to that uh, small population. But what, what do we know about the trend of that population? So, uh, historic records suggest that there were thousands of animal in the Gaspésie Peninsula uh, at the beginning of uh, the 20th century, but it uh, quickly dropped to uh, something like 750 animals by the mid-50s and to 250 animals by the late 70s. Um, it, uh, it leads to Kosovic to attribute a threatened status to that population by the mid-80s, and then an endangered status at the beginning of uh, the 2000 years. Um, the last aerial survey that was conducted by the Quebec government uh, revealed that the population is now around uh, 100 animals. And uh, it was funny because uh, the, the, the report was uh, made public something like a couple of weeks before the Kelsey Week attributed the design designable unit status to that population. What are, what are the potential causes of that decline? Uh, I'm here listing a couple of causes that are verified or not, depending on the information we have, but some are uh, quite interesting hypotheses. So historic records uh, report different uh, episodes of overhunting and poaching in the region. So uh, uh, at the beginning of the last century, uh, two uh, massive uh, killing of caribou in the Gaspésie Peninsula. Sounds like uh, a major disease occurred during uh, a period of apparently 10 years uh, at the beginning of the 20th century too, but we don't have clear information about what kind of disease it was. Um, since that time, we recorded a, a quite strong decrease in major forest cover because of mining, agriculture, logging activity, and since a couple of decades, we registered uh, or we having or collecting evidence that there's other types of human-induced disturbance. One that we can think about is uh, the ecotourism activity would, uh, would take place in the Gaspis National Park with tourists uh, uh, using the hiking and skiing trails to just visit and maybe see caribou and sounds like it's uh, disturbing for those animals. Just to give you an idea, uh, one of my grad students just modeled the functional habitat loss that is induced by caribou avoidance of roads and hiking trails. So it's really interesting because uh, we are uh, within the boundaries of the national park, so that's a place where uh, the amount of the inner disturbance should be uh, quite low. Uh, but it sounds like it's uh, really important for those animals. Uh, on this map, that's an RSF map, where uh, the relative probability of occurrence is high when the polygons are in green and is low uh, when the polygons are in red. So you have uh, the map here of the re uh, relative occurrence probability uh, when there's no linear features that are taken into account. And uh, when we are adding those linear features, we're obtaining a transition from that level of uh, relative occurrence to that level. So it sounds like even in the National Park, linear features are an issue to uh, uh, caribou conservation. And if we just calculated the decrease in uh, relative occurrence uh, in the different habitat types, you can see that it's turn from alpine tundra to, uh, to originating stand to a decrease in functional habitat from 30 to 50 percent. So it's not, you know, it's not uh, trivial and we should take it into account. If you need more details, go visit the poster 20. William will answer to all of your questions. <laughs> yeah, I, you know, I, I, I'm, I have a lot of grad students I'm in the lab, so I'm going to make some publicity. Uh, other potential causes for that decline, uh, here you have a map of uh, Google Herd image of uh, the caribou range in the Gaspésie region. And uh, one thing that we can think about is, are we dealing with three subpopulation there? 
the vhf telemetry survey that we have locations in front of us about a kind of you know grouping around the three different summits so the mount logan, mount talbert and the mount mcgarry goals and we have evidence that there's not that much exchanges of animals between the three summits so it could be an issue maybe we're not dealing with one population of an hundred individuals but maybe with three smaller subpopulation with low exchange another thing is that you can see that outside the gas basin national park there's a lot of cut blocks and those cut blocks are I recognized to maybe well, maybe marco won't be uh, agreeing with me but maybe driving an increase in moose density and for instance we have the higher moose density in quebec recorded around the gas basin national park up to five to nine moose per square kilometer not per 10 square kilometer per square kilometer so that's really impressive and uh, it could also drive to an increase in predation pressure by coyotes and bears because we don't have wolves in that region. Wolves were extirpated a century and a half ago. What about the population trends? We're lucky for the last 30 years we have uh, every year an aerial survey of uh, these animals and you can see that there's a constant decline although there's some uh, fluctuations uh, uh, from years to years. There's a constant decline of those animals and the last aerial survey just uh, on the line that this decline is uh, more severe and if we're looking at the proportion of cows in the population and establishing that uh, sustainability threshold that uh, uh, should prevent the population of declining so you can see that the proportion of cows in the population is essentially always lower than uh, that sustainability threshold and uh, the Quebec government conducted a, a, an experiment in the late 80s um, putting uh, VHF colors on calves and they recorded that uh, calf survival was quite low, essentially because of bear and uh, coyote predation. So they uh, established a predator control program where they were coloring uh, coyotes and bears all around the summits and uh, it sounds like it succeeded because the proportion of calf in the population then increased. So they stopped that predator control program and a couple of years ago uh, the proportion of calf decreased again. So they re established that uh, program in 2001 and since that time uh, year after year there's more and more uh, trapping pressure on uh, bears and coyotes and it sounds like we don't have uh, control of those predators in, in the population so we could just ask it, it maybe the, maybe there's no response of the predator population about uh, that uh, uh, predator control program but it, here you can see that uh, confounding bears and coyotes uh, by attracting or harvesting annually more and more predators, you're going to have more and more calves in the population. But why do we observe that kind of decline in the proportion of calves in this couple of years? Um, a grad student a couple of years ago estimated the abundance of bears and coyotes that could access the summits to 68 bears and 11 coyotes. But since that time, uh, here you have all the capture sites, we're capturing annually something like 30 bears and 15 coyotes years after years. So maybe it suggests that we have kind of sourcing dynamic with coyotes and bears from all around in peninsula just traveling to get into uh, the calving area uh, during the calving, calving season. So what could limit the efficiency of the predator control program? Um, that grad student look at that and uh, using the GPS telemetry for bears and coyotes, uh, he just uh, realized that predators and caribou are spatially segregated with predators mostly in the valleys, caribou mostly uh, at the summits, <coughs> but he also realized that caribou uh, could be visited by bears and by coyotes because those animals are highly mobile and even if they are outside of the uh, gas basin national park, it could just you know, make a short migration toward the summits uh, during the, uh, the window of high yield variability for calves. So it sounds like because of the highly mobile, it could just jeopardize uh, the calf survival. Uh, recently, one of my grad students just tried to uh, establish relationships between uh, uh, predator control and, and, and caribou uh, population. So he looked at, firstly, is there uh, a trend in the annual harvest uh, of coyotes and bear? And it sounds like during the first phase of control, uh, years after years, they were harvesting less and less predators. So it sounds interesting and it turns into a kind of quite satisfying uh, proportion of calf in the population. But during the second phase of control, so from 2001 to today, looks like, okay, uh, the amount, the, the number of uh, bears that are harvesting is decreasing, but the number of coyotes 
is highly increasing, even if we are putting more and more pressure year after year on the population. And it could partly explain the fact that, okay, there's a highly variable proportion of gap in the population. What could explain that situation? Uh, one of my grad students is currently working on different uh, uh, different uh, changes that we could observe in the landscape. And here you have, I don't know why it's this way, but uh, north is on the uh, left side of the screen. You have a, an image of uh, the Gaspis National Park and a 15 kilometer buffer around the park boundaries. Uh, three years ago and today, and in green, sorry, it's in French, in green you have uh, the major forest polygons, and in uh, orange you have the haircuts. And it sounds like even uh, uh, close to a national park, there was a decrease in the, 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 the preferential habitat for caribou. So uh, a park alone could not sustain a current population and we have to just you know put in context uh, the park and uh, the entire landscape. Uh, it looked at what's the relationship between the proportion of uh, young clear cuts within the, 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 the surroundings of the park and the annual moose harvest and it sounds like there is a relationship. So there's more moose if there's more clear cuts and uh, if there's more moose there's also a relationship with the coyotes that are harvested. So uh, it sounds like the habitat surrounding the park is becoming more and more suitable to coyote year after year. We carried out a, a, a quite a simple PDA on uh, this population just to figure out if uh, only looking at uh, survival, if we uh, could manage or plan what we could expect as population trends in the future. And uh, this broken stick graph is really interesting. You see that uh, from uh, 1983 up to now, there's an increase in uh, calf survival followed by a decrease uh, in calf mortality, sorry, followed by a decrease and then followed by a sharp increase in, uh, in calf mortality. And when looking for the adult, you see that there's a slight increase in adult mortality from year to year. Uh, what are the, the impacts on the, 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 the probability of having those animals uh, appearing in the landscape? So you can see that even if there's uh, uh, a variation in calf survival, the population will decrease uh, for sure uh, quite soon. But depending on the adult survival, and, and it's interesting because it, it might be the place where we should put effort, and we never put effort on that point before, there uh, is a highly variable thing. Just a quick uh, couple of slides just to uh, inform you that we just started a new research program with a couple of friends of mine. So, Julie Maggie from uh, the Ministry of Natural Resources and Wildlife. Chris Johnson from UNBC, Fanny Belsi from University of Sherbrooke, and uh, Luc Sebo from University of Quebec at with some collaborators. We're looking at the impact of ecosystem-based management on multiple facets of caribou ecology. We're using that graph that uh, Chris and I published last year uh, to study different, you know, biological scales of uh, the response that we should expect uh, to see uh, in the caribou population. So we're going to monitor habitat selection, habitat use, uh, response to disturbance, biology, diet, genetics, and so on. And we're looking for grad students, so if there's some in the, in the room, if there's some in the room, and if you can just memorize my email address, just send me an email, no problem. So there's a bunch of projects that we are uh, conducting actually in the lab. Uh, join us and uh, help us to just maybe try to find a way to uh, uh, ensure the conservation of that species.